Well, welcome back to uh, our mornings, and Sue now has left me, and John has joined me. But just before we introduce John, I just want to respond to an email that's just come in from what we were talking about before. And this is from uh, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. And it says, we are a small church and used to serve hot meals every Sunday after the service. However, when this wonderful family joined the church, the wife being a qualified chef brought to our attention that we shouldn't be serving food the way we did, as we have some elderly folk and also small children who are supposedly in high risk category. And in case they caught a bug, the social services would trace it back to the church. Our kitchen in the church, although it's equipped with a cooker, etc., is mainly licensed for tea and coffee service only. Lots of elderly single folk, whether elderly, so lots of elderly, single folk, whether elderly or not, and couples enjoyed the fellowship and the food and used to look forward to the meal. Now, alas, we have to stop serving hot food and limit it to packet soup. And so it's just something to be conscious of and aware of. And it's the same with our church that we have here. You have to have a proper kitchen. You've got to be careful what you are licensed to do and what you're not licensed to do. But let's just check that we can still help people wherever they need that help. Because uh, if there is somebody who really is hungry, you can always take them to your house and give them something to eat if you need to. So, but, but be wise and let's, uh, let's find how we can do this. Anyway, this next part, I am absolutely delighted. John, welcome to the programme. Good day, mate. And um, good to meet you for the first time here in Spain. It's nice to meet you. I've seen you many times on the television, of course, and were great inspiration to me uh, when I was coming to the Lord. And, and mm -hmm. a lot of your subject, for me, helped me take that step of faith. Praise the, the Lord. Word. That's great. So how long are you here in Spain for? Just till uh, a day and a half from now, I arrived yesterday, and as I shared with you before, really glad we left the UK because it's all snowed in on the airports there today. So, so yes, it's, it's good to be here where the sun is shining and, and it's a moderately warm day. Yeah, because you've just come from the UK. I've just come from the UK, yeah. that's yeah. right. Now, you, you've been in the UK for what, eight, eight I've weeks? I've been there eight weeks. Uh, Have everywhere you just been doing a conference and running around? Conferences, research, uh, fossil digging, leading teenagers on where, field where trips. Where uh, Everywhere from sort of Lancaster across to the northeast of Scotland. Can so, you briefly tell me what you found? Sure. Uh, we found a busload of teenagers that we took on a field <laughs> trip. And we were out there collecting beautiful, <coughs> excuse me, beautiful mm. fossil leaves. And this is sort of uh, up towards Ingle, Ingle, Ingleton. Right. Uh, and uh, so beautiful fossil leaves in the limestone and in the coal fields there and fossil, vertical fossil trees right. uh, upright through the rocks, demolishing the belief that it took millions of years. Because it goes um, through the layers. Because it goes through right. multiple layers. And uh, then up in Scotland, uh, I was digging up fossil squids with fossil trees. Now, as I keep telling people, you all know the squids swim through the forest or the forest grows amongst the squids. Take your pick. <laughs> but really what we've been trying to do over the years is teach people, A, you can ask questions like, if God created creatures, each after their kind, what would the evidence be even in the rocks? Mm. And the answer is trees would always look something like trees. They'd produce after their own kind. And squids would be pretty much squid-like, right? Yeah, yeah. And if you find them, therefore, animals from the sea and animals from the land mixed together, you can recognize a flood deposit. Mm. And the reason for those two things is very quick. You see, we live in a world in which people say, creation, that's just a blind belief. Yeah. There's no evidence for it. And Noah's flood, fairy story. So we love to teach people how to recognize a flood deposit and how to recognize the evidence for creation, yeah. even when they fall over it in the ground. Well, we're going to look at some of that a little bit later in, in this hour. Um, but we're going to start, actually, by just putting a little piece on of your newest, uh, I think it's your newest DVD. Yes, it is. That's um, right. So let's just have a look at this and see what John has been up to.
away. We're just getting ready for a big fossil display here. Have you noticed that people love dead things? Particularly ones like this. A fabulous little starfish still trapped crawling over these fossil shells. He was buried so quickly he didn't even have time to let go before he became a fossil. And if that impresses you, have a look at what's behind these doors. These have just come from our fossil preparation workshop. How's that? Fantastic fossil trilobites. Oh, try, one, two, three. Lobe, well you can see the lobes. One, two, three as well. Old word. But have you noticed something? People love to touch dead things. Perhaps they want to get in touch with their real history. But have a look at this one. This one nearly broke our backs as we loaded it up. How's that for spectacular? I mean, the beautiful black marble really sets it off, and these long, thin, pointy things are the shells of squid-like creatures. And you don't have to be Einstein to realise that most of them are pointing in the one direction. They've been washed into place. This is not where they lived. This is just where they're dead. But how did they get to be dead? And how long ago was it? And what does it tell you about your past? Welcome to Australia's Janolan Caves. Huge, beautiful and exciting. And now regarded as the oldest open cave system in the world. But when I first went there as a teenager, they told us it was only a few thousand years old. Then, in 1999, it went to 100 million years of age. And now it's listed as more than 340 million. And you think you're getting old fast. The same is true for this famous fossil Aussie. In 1910, he was labelled 180 million years old. In 1987, 200 million. But by 1999, it had been both reconfigured and relabeled as 235 million years. There is one more thing you need to know about fossils. You too can see fabulous fossil fishes like this if you visit places like the San Diego Museum. But you'll discover one thing. It's not just enough to be dead to be a fossil. You have to be older than 10,000 years. Now why not 11? Why not 9? The reality is it doesn't matter whether you're a beautifully preserved opalized shell from Australia and you're more than 10,000 years old, or you're a fabulously preserved land plant and sea creature from Germany and you're over 100 million years old. If any of those ages were correct, you could not read Genesis or Exodus as real history. But those ages are just the latest opinions. They're theories. They're not facts. I'm John Mackay. Join me as we travel the globe looking at all the evidence of creation of this wonderful planet that you and I live on. Don't you just love spooky? Caves are about as spooky as you can get. Here in this cave, they used to dig up the, the bat poo and, and process it. That's what these, these trays are left over from, from the Civil War. And they used to turn it into ammunition. I guess that's the original dirty bomb. But just look above me. There's a row of stalactites, only tiny ones. And you only find in this cave the stalactites are on the cracks because that's where the water comes down. I know you go to the tourist caves and they say, don't touch them, don't put your fingerprints on them. They take so long to grow. Actually, they don't take time to grow. That's why they're only on the cracks. That's where the water comes down. Water is the most important part of the process. Time is the least. Let's prove it to you. Well, if you want to see the proof of that, you're going to have to buy the DVD. So just to keep you a taste of it. Anyway, we have John with us in the studio. And it's a delight to have you with the studio. Now, one of the things that I saw uh, on the YouTube, I think it was, mm -hmm. is that Richard Dawkins... Uh, interviewed you, that's what mm -hmm. they classed it as, I'm not quite sure that's what it was, but was that, that fairly recent? Um, he did that for that series of programs they did on Channel 4, right. and uh, you saw just a tiny pieces of those interviews, and he's since released segments of the other ones, so whether you could call it interview, harangue, mock, debate, whatever mm, you want to yeah. call it, but yes, you just Google Mackay and Dawkins, or Dawkins and Mackay, depending on who you think is more important, mm. and that will come up, so people can see his efforts 
to demolish creation and creator and mm. how easy it is to demolish Dawkins. Well, I must admit now, now I have to, I have to you know, put my cards on the table that, that I believe that God created mm -hmm. uh, uh, over that short period of time. So um, I'm not arguing the point with you. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I noticed about what he was saying is that um, and he's a very intelligent man. He's very serious about what he believes. But the point that I thought he couldn't hear you say was that he was taking everything from the view that what is happening today has always happened. There's no doubt about it. And he couldn't the, hear you say that, could he? The atheist, the atheist has no other option mm. because if you abandon God, if you don't believe in history and if you think that we are the most important and intellectual giants because our brains evolved, then the only reliable data is what you report. Yeah. So therefore you believe that what I see around me is the only way I can understand past, present and future. Yeah. Now the old Greeks did that except they called it man was the measure of all things. The 17th century did that, they called it humanism, right? right? Rationalism. It's no different. But yes, he could not understand when I said, now listen, there is another option. God was there, Darwin wasn't. Take it from God's perspective and you'll get it right. Yeah take it from your perspective and who cares who Richard Dawkins yeah. is in 20 years time there'll be somebody else at the top of the academic bar. Right. Well you, you were talking uh, at one point about carbon dating mm -hmm. and saying that that doesn't stand up and he, he was more or less agreeing with you that, that it's not as uh, effective as it could be but he was then saying but of course there's all lots of other ways of doing it and, and you kept saying yes but you're assuming that the way things are working today is the way things have always worked. The laws of nature have mm -hmm. always been the same. So, and he, he just didn't catch that. I, I don't know whether no, he was he ignoring did. it or didn't hear it, but he yeah. certainly didn't catch it because he would still come up with, yes, but we have this way of testing, this way mm -hmm. of testing. And it all didn't hear the question that maybe it was different before. What ways do you think, from a, a biblical point of view, from what you've seen in the earth, what ways do you think, we'll call them the laws of nature, if you like, how were they different compared to what we see today? Okay, let me just go back one tiny step and remind people that when they keep saying, but we've got this method and this method, and they all agree, mm. I love to ask them, well, listen, we started with uranium-lead dating. Why do you think we had to invent a second method and then a third method and then a fourth method? And the only answer is because we knew that the others had weaknesses. And right. I predict we'll keep inventing new ones because if any of them worked, we wouldn't need to do it. Right. So there's practical point number one. When you look at the things that the Bible says God did, yeah. in the beginning he created the heavens and the yeah. earth, you have God, a plural singleness as it were, Elohim mm. is a Hebrew word, it's a name for God, mm. or not a name but a title, title but yeah. it's plural as well as singular. It's got a, a, a male verb that goes with it in terms of creation, so you know a lot about this God, mm. maleness, plurality and yet singleness mm. and then he stamps his nature on creation so hence people like Isaac Newton believed in a universe one set of laws uni one verse right. meaning laws so yeah. so that's been the dominant philosophy of science which has basically been a Christian or Judeo-Christian belief system there's one set of laws let's go find them right. now you become an evolutionist and even the laws have to evolve so, yes, we've moved on. We don't need a universe anymore. We can have a diverse or a triverse or whatever. But what you do is also say, only the things I can see, the uniformity around me, mm. that's always been the rule because I've left God out. I can't have anything outside yeah. of that. Okay, so what would have been different in the past? Charles Darwin's a great illustration. He looked around him and he assumed there's kill or be killed now. There's always been kill or be killed. You go to the biblical account, God said he made everything very good and it's not just a moral situation. The two verses before it refer to everything, man included, being vegetarian. As I love to remind the teenagers, no McDonald's in the Garden of Eden, right? <laughs> so what you will find is that all the creatures, the lion lay down with the lamb, they both ate grass just like the ox. Everything was very good, no bars on the gorilla cage or and whatever. he talks about being restored to that. Yes, and he talks yeah. about later on bringing it back to that mm. when the sin has finally been dealt with and death has finally been dealt mm. with. So the evolutionist, whether it's Dawkins or whether it's Darwin, has to assume whatever the world is like now in all of its nastiness. Mm. And come on, Howard, you became a Christian. I became a Christian because we know that there's nastiness in us. Exactly. And we, we didn't 
like it. We needed somebody to do something about it, and we knew we couldn't. Mm. So now that we know Jesus, he's dealt with that issue in us. Mm. So what you find is the difference is God made the world good, now it's not. That has been a significant change. Mm. Secondly, when you look at what Adam was wearing, now, coming from Australia, where we have lots of harsh radiation and the Europeans who've moved to Australia have the highest death rate from skin cancer on the planet. And if you've ever seen right. a man with his nose half eaten off with skin mm. cancer or his ear falling off, then you know skin cancer is not good. So the amount of radiation we're getting now in Australia is not like it was when Adam and Eve had how many clothes on? Mm, none. None. Yeah. How, how big was their hat? Mm. It wasn't, it wasn't right? Yeah. So therefore, there was something different about that planet. And we get a few clues. So you're saying the atmosphere they were living in was, was different. It was the whole got to make a atmosphere of the atmosphere, atmosphere was changed. good. And one clue may be mm. one of the things that seems to have changed even measurably in the past 400 years is the strength of the magnetic field. Mm. Right? And if you were to increase that magnetic field, then you'd reduce the amount of radiation. Mm. If you were to put more ozone up there, remember all the kerfuffle we had about the collapsing yeah. ozone layer? Yeah, yeah. We knew that if we lost that protective layer, we'd increase radiation, we'd increase mutation, cancer, etc., etc. Mm. So there's been lots of clues in our present world that you can't assume it's always been the same. Mm. Even when I look at, say, some of the plants, um, I was uh, filming another project, and people can see on creationresearch.net mm. and link through to our YouTube, we did a program called uh, Darwin on the Rocks, right? In which we took people out to see some of the fossil plants we dug up, and those scrawny little mare's tails, or horse tails, rushes as they call them in the UK and, and around the globe, that today are maybe 18 inches tall in most places, they're up to 100 feet tall in the rocks. Right. And then when you dig out the fossil amber, you get a bit of a clue. Yeah. You find that there used to be more oxygen and more carbon dioxide, and plants love carbon dioxide. Mm. So the current kerfuffle about, oh, we've got to keep the, the atmosphere the same. We don't want any more CO2. My attitude, let it go. The plants will love it. And if yeah, the yeah. plants love it, we'll get more oxygen. We'll do better. Yeah. right? And more oxygen, more ozone, less radiation, more back to be what it yeah. should be. So what we're saying is that the amount of, I'll use the word ingredients, whatever you want to call them, that are in what we see today would have been different in the past. And Definitely therefore you can't work out how long different. it took for them to disappear. No, that's right. So you, you're actually stuck. <coughs> so if you just say, I'm going to only look at the present, then you're really stuck. It stops you being wise enough to realise, hey, if I make an atom bomb, I just speed it up the rate of radioactive decay. Yeah. Why am I assuming nothing else can do that? So there's the, the fallacy, man is, is God, G-O-D, little g. Yeah. That's, that's what uniformitarian is. Right, okay, I just managed to find... Oh, it's from Graham Supernova, who's a regular mm -hmm. listener. Hi, Graham, nice to speak, uh, see you this morning. And uh, he asked this one because he doesn't agree with everything that mm -hmm. we say, which is fine, mm -hmm. but he's open to talk about it and tells when he doesn't. He says, good morning, team. How does John date his fossils since he has rubbished the current dating methods enjoyed this morning's... Oh, <laughs> since he's rubbished... The current data methods. enjoyed this morning's propaganda by the way so you can see where mm -hmm. he's coming from but, mm -hmm. but it's a good question so how would you date your fossils okay let's be brutally blunt with this we had dates for the fossils long before radioactive dating and any geologist worth his salt barely uses radioactive dating to date a fossil. Right. In fact, if I was to send a specimen for carbon-14 dating, I'd recommend he spends the money and does this just to prove I'm telling the truth. Right. Take the specimen, break it into 10 pieces, send it to 10 different labs, but don't tell them where it came from. And what you will find is you get 10 different results. What do they normally do? They want to know where you found it because then they can f look up their tables to see what it should be and eliminate the other nine wrong dates. Right. Right? And yeah. so that, that's what they would do in practice. But we had dates for these. Like you read Charles Darwin, the dinosaurs died out 300 million years ago in his first edition. Mm. Now, what you'll find is these dates were basically made up. So that I hate to say it, but in 1867, we see the dating of the Ordovician. Now, the Ordovici people used to live on the border of England and Wales, and, and you will find that the rocks that they studied there are named after them. Right. But the question is, how old are they? The first geologist said, OK, we can figure this out roughly. God made the world. It was very good. No death, no fossils. Adam sinned, death, but nothing to bury things so they couldn't become fossils. Noah's flood, 
are death and rapid burial, there's the first possibility of fossils. So right. you can read the first book in the university libraries at Cambridge and Oxford on the fossils and Noah's flood. So they took history as an authority and tried to fit the data in the present back into that picture. Now along comes Charles Lyell and Charles Darwin, who's his disciple, and they work together. But Charles Lyell has already established his framework. I'm going to remove Moses. Moses' oh, we'll creation, show a clip on that in a moment. Noah's flood, yeah. 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 And what you'll find is that late in 1867, Lyell and Darwin teamed up to find the age of the rocks over there in the Ordovician. Right. And basically there's 12 layers of rocks, 12 layers of snails, and, and, and Lyell's question is, how long does it take one species of snail to evolve into another? Darwin's answer, 20 million years. Now listen, you're smart enough to figure out, did Darwin ever watch snails evolve to measure that 20 million? Yeah. No, never, never, never did, because we've never been here 20 million years, right, to observe snails. So the first figures are just simply made up, 12 times 20, 240. So now you know the Ordovician is at least 240 plus million years old. Now, our friend, despite his sincerity there, he needs to understand that that's doing nothing different than what I would do. You see, my authority is the God who was there. The first geologist said Noah's flood is the first possibility and any catastrophe since then. I totally accept that framework mm. and I totally reject Lyell's framework. Let's make it up as we go because that's what they've done, and then they've added radioactive dating as a self-justification. So what, what, you, what you're saying really is that we just don't know how old any of them are. That's correct. We only on know they we were here before you and I sat yeah. down at this table. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers that, Graham, but what we're saying is that we don't know how old they are, but if we look from a biblical account, they yep. can't be any older than You see, it establishes a really years. important principle. Science works well in the present. Mm. Right. The minute you try and go backwards, you have to humble yourself and say, all I've got is the present. If I'm going to go backwards, I need at least one assumption, one faith statement, one bias, one prejudice. Yeah. And I'll either put my faith in God who was there mm. or I'll put my faith in Darwin and Dawkins who weren't. I have no other options. Mm. If I want to do a test for tomorrow, hey, will this uranium decompose at the fixed rate by tomorrow? I can wait and I can test it, but I can't go backwards. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, let's watch this clip and just see. Uh, it's not got the best soundtrack in the world on it, but we'll just have a look at this clip. And it's talking about um, Charles Lyell. Hey, everyone. Josh here from A Load of Schist. Today, we're going to cover uniformitarianism. It's a bit of a mouthful, I know, but it is a very important geological principle that all geologists should understand. So you may be wondering who this guy is. His name is James Hutton. He's known as the father of modern geology. Why is he known as the father of modern geology? Simply put, he was one of the first people to comment that the Earth must be more than just a few thousand years old. He came to this conclusion by observing that many of the geological processes that we see going on today do in fact occur over a very, very slow time scale. Because of this, the geological structures that we see today must have taken more than just a few thousand years to form. There's a bit of opposition to these claims, and you know what, there still is opposition to these claims, I guess. However, Hutton was firmly on the wrong side of popular opinion at this time. His idea was considered outrageous by many people. This is because many people believed that the Earth was effectively static, and then some sort of major event occurred which changed things up. For instance, the Neptunists believed that all rocks precipitated out of a massive flood. Hutton's theory remained obscure until this dude came along, Charles Lyell. Other than having awesome sidebirds, he was also good mates with another famous guy by the name of Charles Darwin. In fact, Darwin on his famous voyage of the Beagle read a book Charles Lyell had written. It was a very famous geological book called The Principles of Geology. This book, in a way, popularized Hutton's ideas, and in this book he penned the saying, the present is the key to the past. This is a very famous saying you'll hear geologists quoting all the time. But what does this actually mean? The present is the key to the past. What does that mean? It's easy. Basically, just what's going on now was going on in the past. The laws of nature have not changed between now and the past. However, do we still think like this? Do we still believe that the present is the key to the past? Well, Lyle's ideas actually remained for about a hundred years, until the 1960s when the theory of plate tectonics became accepted in the scientific community. Although we still accept uniformitarianism, we think of it slightly differently. Namely, we realise that things have changed through time like erosion, 
but also we accept that catastrophes have a very important role in shaping geology as well. This all here is known as the principle of geological actualism. So what should you take away from this lesson? Well, you should know who the father of modern geology is. You should also be able to briefly explain uniformitarianism. And you should also know who that guy was with the wicked sideburns and the cool cloak. But most importantly, you should understand what modern geologists think with regards to the past and the present. And that's it. I hope well, we're just looking there. We're looking there, John, at these guys that, that put this principle in place. Mm -hmm. And as Christians... Um, I was going to ask you this question a little later, but I'll ask you it now. I find that one of the difficulties I think we have as Christians is when we're talking to somebody who has got a scientific understanding, whether they are well understanding of science, but the, the man in the street, we tend to sort of very often say, well, it's this way because the Bible said it. And that doesn't actually help at all because they don't agree with the Bible. They don't believe it's true. And so they, they, they sort of reject us as being complete idiots. Not only do we not know what we're talking about, but we believe it from this black book. So... As Christians, when we're talking about these situations, is it good for us to know these type of things, that these, we can speak to somebody in the street and say, well, do you know that it was Lyle who set up this thing? Are, are these good things for us as Christians to know? You will find that if you want to communicate to anybody, whether you are a salesman, mm. right, whether you're an engineer or someone who wants to do a debate, you have to know your enemy as well as you know your friend. Mm. You have to know what they're thinking. It's no good just knowing what you're thinking. So that when you talk to someone who believes in evolution, they may see it as a fact, but you have to find, okay, my job is to sell them a different idea and how do I unpack it so that they will accept it? So okay. simple illustration, you're in Alaska, you're trying to sell refrigerators to Eskimos in the middle of winter. You're a Christian. Oh Lord, send us more global warming now. Because <laughs> without that, they won't see any reason for accepting the refrigerator. So you have to find a way to undermine their own paradigm. And you're quite right. They see you, if all you say is, I read it in the Bible. There's nothing wrong with saying that. No, there's not. But you realize they think they're dealing with the evidence, where in reality, what they're saying is, I read it in Darwin. Yeah. Right? Because none of them have ever seen anything evolve. They're not evolving. Right? They've never made anything evolve. So yeah. they have a blind faith position in exactly the same way as they think they're rightly accusing you of. So you do need to understand where they're coming from. It's arrogance and prejudice, attitude, not evidence. Yeah. So there's the first principle. Secondly, having been up to uh, C, you saw that nice diagram of what's called Hutton's unconformity mm. there. It's just outside of Jedburgh in southern eastern Scotland. I've checked it there. I've checked it down on the coast. I've checked it as any place I can find it, right? Mm. And what you find is uh, Hutton is more famous for something that everybody needs to know. I was climbing up Knockin Crag. This is one of these tall mountains uh, right. on the west of Scotland. Tall place, you know, big place, carved by glaciers, etc. And one of your first steps, because the geological societies had a lot to do with this, they put a quote there from Hutton. I see no sign of a beginning and no vestige of an end. Now, there's the key point to Hutton. Mm. It's not, you know, his understanding of the rocks. It's his understanding that said, I can leave God out wherever I like. Yeah. Now, therefore, it shouldn't surprise you that the theologians around Edinburgh in his day said, this man's an atheist. Mm. Because if you see no sign of a beginning and no vestige of an end, then yeah. you've just ruled God out. So there's his hidden premise, mm. right? And you need to be honest and say, listen, I'm coming as a Christian. I make no, I don't hide from that. But you're pretending not to be an atheist when you are, right? right? And so that, that's the second yeah. thing you need to establish. And lastly, you will find that if you're someone who has no science background, don't ever try to pretend to be a scientist, right? Mm. Um, I know one of my scientific friends who is an atheist, right? And uh, an ardent atheist wrote textbooks that are world famous. Mm. And he's now a Christian. And he's written books, and we sell them. One of them called Creation, the Facts of Life. Right. Uh, and the reason he became a Christian is because he was hungry. And a Christian group was cooking donuts and coffee <laughs> and giving them free, right? Did they have the right license. Yeah, that's right. So you need to have the right <laughs> food license. That's yeah. right. But in reality, if you don't have the scientific background, you don't. every one of us doesn't have to be a scientist. Yeah. But you do have to say, Lord Jesus, I'm here for you. Mm. Give me wisdom to reach this person mm. all right, with all that I know of. So if you are a scientist, then yes, you have an obligation to actually know your stuff. Mm. Because the Bible does say, test everything mm. and only keep the things that are true 
And Peter says, have a reason for what you believe. So if anybody asks you a question, you can give them an answer. So those of you out there who are, are, are scientists in yeah. the scientific community, know your stuff and know it well. And go to creationresearch.net and find out a lot find more it. about it. And we as believers, we need to know why we believe what yes. we believe. Yes. And it's okay to have a... Uh, just a faith that's not backed up with anything, that's not going to stop you getting to heaven because no, it's faith right. in Christ. But it really does help to understand why mm -hmm. you believe what you believe. Well, particularly since you're instructed by Jesus to love him with your brains. Yeah. And by Peter, the, mm -hmm. the least educated of the apostles. You know, he, you know a mm -hmm. grade five dropout took up fishing, <laughs> uh, chopped people's ears off before yeah. he gets saved, right? Yeah. So he's the one the Holy Spirit uses to say, you better have a reason for what you believe. Yeah. And it, the other thing, of course, is if they are trying to take Moses out, which is what they're saying, they're trying to take this whole idea, what they're sort of talking about is taking out the first five books of the Bible so they don't count. But as Christians, uh, Jesus said that what Moses said was important. And so if what Moses said is not right, the whole gospel falls to pieces, doesn't it? Well, the simple illustration is, you know, I meet many evangelicals who don't want to get embarrassed with this six-day discussion mm. or the age of the earth or Noah's flood, and they want to start, say, from Abraham... And I love to gently chastise them and say, you can't do that. Why not? Well, Moses is after Abraham. Mm. Let's read the Ten Commandments. And one of them says, in six days God created the heavens and the earth, and the seventh day he rested. Therefore, six days you will labor, and the mm. seventh day you will rest. Now jump to Galatians, mm. where Paul says the law was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. Yeah. So the reason for those Ten Commandments, including how you spend your week, is to prove to you you're a sinner. Mm. You actually can't meet God's standards, one of which is based on creation. Yeah. And if you can't meet that, you're a sinner. Sinners need saviors. End of argument, yeah. right? So you can't start with Abraham. The Ten Commandments are based mm. on Genesis chapter yeah. 1. So as a believer, it's important for us to... Yep understand why we believe right. it. Well, you, the, you're, this evening you're on, on Q&A, aren't you? Okay, and too. so I'm sure you're going to get lots and lots coming through. But let me, just, uh, let me just look at one or two we've got on here. Okay, uh, this is from Bill. It says, how did the multitude of flowering plants survive the flood? Okay, good question. And one that really a most unexpected person answered. And the unexpected person is Charles Darwin. Right. And he didn't set out to answer this question, but his experiment actually provided the answer. I came across it uh, many, many years ago when I was involved in education. And for seven years, I got my science students to repeat Darwin's experiment to see if we got the same answer. So seven years is a pretty yeah. good test because the flood is only one year and 10 days long. Mm. Read, start from Genesis 7, yeah. 11 and, and read on. Not 40 days and 40 nights. No, no, that's, think. that was that's, the rain. That's right, right yeah. So what you'll find is that how do you keep plants alive for one year and 10 days at the least? Noah did have to take plants on board, by the way, because even though God sent the animals, you'll find Noah was instructed to go and get the food. That's right. So therefore, since all the creatures started out vegetarian, we know very well he would have had grain for the grain eaters and vegetables mm. for the vegetable eaters and grass for the grass eaters, right, and had all of that on board. So many of the plants that we refer to as domestic, you know, the crops okay. that we use, they would have already been on board. So they didn't have to survive. But the others who that you don't normally think of as, as edible or even you know, the ones that we would use as easy to eat. Yeah. Um, they had to survive outside. So what did Darwin do? He collected wild seeds, domesticated seeds of all sorts of plants, and he put them in water, dated it, locked it up. Then he would come back and one a month or one a week, whatever, he would take a seed out one year, two years, three years, seven years, and test it. And here's what he discovered. Most of the plants that we call domestic, actually, within a few weeks, they swell up and <coughs> you end up with not just beans, but bean beer, bean broth, right? right. They ferment yeah. and, and you've had it. But the undomesticated ones, they'll grow, they'll grow. Seven years later, they'll grow. I know, my, my students mm. did it, right? Yeah, yeah. And it didn't matter whether you had them underwater for one year or two years or seven years, they grew up. And I puzzled about this because... Uh, I, I spoke to one of the plant experts. My, my background's geology, right? Oh, yeah. I love plants, but I'm not an expert at them. And basically, you could watch the plants begin to swell up, and then they would stop. And I asked them, what's happening? And they said, well, the plant's got an inbuilt water level detector, Incredible, and it will form a ins an insulating layer, and then it will wait 
until the ground goes dry enough before it takes any more in and then it will sprout. And I thought, that is genius level. Mm. Nextly, what you discover is we've known that for ages. We've just never thought about it, particularly us Aussies, because yeah. we've just finished a 10-year drought with massive floods last year. Right. But one of the things many farmers noticed, the pond dries out, dries out. It's been full of water for seven years. Yeah, yeah. And as soon as it dries out, the grass comes up. The seeds well, are actually true, in the mud, right? Yeah, right? Yeah. And they've been there for years and years and years. We've yeah. seen some of our big domestic reservoirs that have had water in them for 50 years. Yeah. Dry up, up comes the grass. So no problem. Thanks for the question. Yeah, a really good one. And, uh, you know, they can see a lot more of these questions on askjohnmackay.com yeah. where we deliberately post them for people to read. Yeah. Okay, we've got one in here. It says, uh, Dear Dr. Mackay and Howard, why are the scientists and governments insisting there is global warming for what purpose? And why are they cutting down ash trees and telling us it's some weird disease? It's all very odd to me, Elaine. Does that well, make sense to you? Uh, yes, the okay. two, two of them are actually not quite connected. The ash right. trees are related to a, an alleged virus that I can't comment on one way or the other because A, we don't have too many ash trees in Australia. B, it's not a problem yet in Australia. C, I do know there's been lots of news about some of the viruses that affect ash trees coming into the UK and a big squabble over, should we have to import plants from the EU? So I won't go there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in reality, this, the other part of it about global warming uh, is a very real issue. Uh, you may remember in one of the previous questions I referred to the size of plants. Well, one of the most interesting reports I've come across was the discovery a few years ago of a gigantic fossil snake. Right. Now, this snake was roughly 15 metres, 45 feet nearly long. And the scientist who found it, Dr. Head, wrote a report up and he said this animal lived in Paleocene neotropics. In other words, old forest that was warm. That's right. a good translation, that right? Yeah. And he said, which had much more CO2. Now, this is not popular with governments, but in reality, he knows like I know, because we set up many years ago some terrariums, and we isolated them from the atmosphere, we put seeds in them, and we doubled, tripled, and quadrupled the amount of CO2. And the more CO2 you put in, the more the plants did, and the better the plants did, the more oxygen yeah. they breathed out. So you think of a forest in which you have more CO2, the plants do better, there's more food for the animals, there's more food for everything, yeah. and you don't have to work so hard with your lungs or your heart, so you live longer. And if you're a reptile, here's where that matters. Unlike you, Howard, who kept growing till you're 14 or 15 and then you stop, snakes don't, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So the older they get, the bigger they are, the better the oxygen, the longer their heart lasts, etc., etc. Mm. So you want to know the negative of that? <clears throat> Why are governments promoting climate change, uh, global warming? It has nothing to do with the evidence whatsoever. CO2 has been increasing ever since my friend in Australia has been measuring. He's been measuring for 20 years right. and it's kept going up for the past five years, but the climate's actually turned around it's actually the temperature is going down the only reason tax <coughs> right well it's that's it certainly they are they are certainly <coughs> making financial benefit out yeah. of that and and getting the poorer countries really yep, to, to get right. involved with that okay there's um i'll ask you this one this is this is uh, this is from eddie this this is actually a slight different sort of question because uh, john is the geologist but we'll just look at the question it said why did god have to drown the innocent toddlers and babies in noah's flood couldn't he have eradicated them in a more humane way and uh, not an easy question to answer but no, no uh, it isn't um but in reality it reflects more on our perspective mm. concerning god and judgment than on truth based on god's perspective you and I live in an atomic society, Howard. It's part of the problem of homelessness. And you see, we treat people as if they're only individuals. They're free to do whatever they like. Yeah. Um, you know, husbands and wives are no longer regarded as a couple. They're two separate individuals mm -hmm. and they can go their own ways at the drop of a pen at the bottom of a letter. Yeah. Right? They don't need any vast legal process anymore. So we live in a society that views everybody as independent. Mm -hmm. Now, God has never had that view. Right, so hence you'll find that God not only deals with individuals, he deals with them as part of a family first Absolutely. and as part of a society next. Mm. So what you'll find is when God said through Moses, the sins of the fathers pass on to the third and fourth generation, mm. you will find that if my dad's an alcoholic, 
I will actually suffer his reneging of his responsibility to look after me. Yeah. But if my dad's an atheist and he goes out of his way to train me to be one, then it's my father's fault if I reap God's judgment, yeah. right? God never just deals with me as an individual alone. There's the whole of society and the family in particular. So as tough as we might think it is, God not only has the right to judge because we're his property, yeah. but secondly, he warned everybody through Noah. You may remember Noah was a preacher of righteousness mm -hmm. and Noah was there specifically say, okay, you parents, okay, you children, you're welcome on board. The ticket is free. Yes. God's grace is extended to you. So any parent who reached out and said, no, son, you can't go. Please don't blame God. It's yeah. like blaming God for the wars in the, in, the, in, the, in the Balkans or whatever. It was us that pulled the triggers. Exactly. Let's stop blaming God. Mm -hmm. uh, and God had the right to judge. He even made free salvation available, just like he does for everybody on the planet today. Now, how does this relate? Because that's quite hard to take if you're mm -hmm. coming from a, uh, a normal human life point of view. It's quite difficult to take. But I, but I agree with you that that is the principle that's behind. And, of course, God was trying to make sure that the world and the knowledge of the one true God was still available so the Messiah could come, mm -hmm. so some could eternally be saved, yep. to use that expression. Had he just let um, sin run its course, then possibly the Messiah wouldn't have come and nobody would have had the opportunity. So in the same way now that we're talking about uh, nations and is it fair with God isn't speaking to this one or not getting into that one, we're in exactly the same boat, aren't we? Through the biblical stories, many times the enemies of God's people mm -hmm were there because somebody that knew God at some point did something that God said don't do mm -hmm. and there was a whole offspring of people that went away rejecting God. There's no doubt about it. Like if you take, I was doing a debate in uh, <coughs> Liverpool Cathedral uh, and it was just after the tsunami in Indonesia, right, mm. that had hit Bandar Aceh really severely <coughs> killed several hundred thousand people really. Uh, and people said, well, you know, what sort of a God would do this? Mm. And by the way, that, that debate is available on DVD if folks want to see the, the, the evolutionists politely being beat, beat up. Mm. Um, a huge crowd that night. But somebody wanted to know, you know, is this how God works? You know, what, what rights he got? Is this part of God's sovereign will, etc.? And I had to remind them, you need to see this from an eternal perspective. Yeah. Because the place that suffered most devastation had a basic rule, no Christians. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Nobody's allowed to come here, <coughs> excuse me, with the good news of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But when those severe so-called natural forces uh, took out basically the whole of that area, and then they discovered that the Christians were ready and willing and able to come and do good things for them and help mm. them, then for the first time, those barriers relaxed, and now the gospel was free to go. Mm. So think of it from God's perspective. Leave them free and alone, and all of them go to hell, mm. or have a natural disaster, and some of them respond to God's free offer of salvation yeah. that, that their parents had stopped them hearing beforehand. It's, it, it's hard, but it's, it's what the Bible tells us yeah, is truth. Right. And, and, and we believe that is truth. And God does not want any to be lost. The Bible is very clear on that. He wants all people to repent and turn to him. And that's why you have programs like this. That's why you have programs that are looking at the natural world, for want of mm. a better word as well, looking at what the Bible actually says. And it, as the viewer, it's your choice what you want to do with that information. But the Bible is very, very clear that he wants none to be lost, but so that you're not lost, you need to repent and turn to him and accept him as your saviour. It's that simple, isn't it, really? That's right. And that's either right. we're right or we're wrong, but well, you think that's what we believe Well, you think sometimes right. we're put in that situation of even having to make godlike decisions. If you think back in World War II, mm. when we had the Enigma coding machine and Churchill's faced with decisions, do I warn the people in this town to flee because we know the Germans are bombing them tonight? Mm. And if we warn them, they'll know we have the Enigma. Do I sacrifice 50 people mm. and keep 500,000 alive? Or do I free 50 and suffer thousands more dead? The Germans will change the code. What a decision to, you'd have to make. From so, a yes, human perspective, from a human perspective. It's not a right answer, man, is there? But, no. But it's, it's good that God knows more than mm. we know. Right, we've got one in here. It says, um, from Arthur, thank you. It says, I only have to walk in a beautiful garden on a summer's day to know that there is a God. I don't need any more proof, Arthur. 
Well, what you're looking at, Arthur, is the proof of Romans 1.20, mm. where it says, Even the invisible things of God from the beginning of the creation have been clearly seen and they're understood by the things that are made so that men have no excuse. And so, mm. Arthur, what you just learned is God loves pretty things. But <laughs> if you're some of the young people... He, li came... he likes me as well, though. I'm OK. <laughs> well, I'm sorry about that, Howard, but your, your beauty has long departed. <laughs> right. But yes, he still loves you. If you're some of those young men who came in one of the youth camps I ran mm. and we were teaching them horse riding and uh, they went and jumped three of them together on this big old draft horse and I'll be honest ha Howard that horse winked at me and I thought I know what that horse is going to do smart old thing just yeah. hobbles over here and tips them into the thorn bush yeah, yeah. one of the things you learn from gardens too is that things are no longer as good as they should be mm. so God is an author of beauty but a God of judgment too that's right, absolutely right. Well, one of the things that we were looking at, and we were, lads in the back, we won't show the final clip, which is fine. One of the things we're looking at from Genesis is that when God put man in the garden, uh, or mankind in the garden, he uh, put Adam there and then he had Eve with him, he gave him responsibility over the creation. And so we have God's given responsibility over creation and with the animals and everything else. And we've not done a particularly good job on that. Um, if there is no creator, then do we not get what we see today, that man just has no responsibility for anything around him? You will find that one of the <clears throat> impossible things for the Dawkinses and the Attenboroughs and the BBCs of this world to actually explain is, if we started out in the Big Bang with hydrogen, Hydrogen is mindless. Mm. Hydrogen has no sex. There are no little boy hydrogens, right? Hydrogen has no attitude. Hydrogen has no morals. And yet you end up with a person who even as an atheist said, well, if there is no God, it is wrong for Christians to actually teach their children about a hell. So we must morally act against them. Yeah. So an atheist and a Christian both have religious rules. They both believe in right and wrong. But the atheist says, I came from hydrogen. It has no right and wrong. He has an absolutely inconsistent moral view of the planet. Mm. But yes, you will find in the end, he has to either say, well, my cousin is a fern, so I can't touch it. Mm. And you see that long-term result in places like India, yeah. where you don't hit a mosquito in case it's your Uncle Fred recycled. Yeah. And Dawkins, you know, when he dies, he's going to be recycled as hydrogen. Mm. So don't breathe him in. You might be breathing Mr. Dawkins back in, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so you'll find you end up with that extreme. And, of course, at the other extreme, you find even the so-called religious amongst us who say, OK, God put me in charge. I can chop down any tree I like for my benefit. And then you discover you make a desert and it's only to your detriment. You and you, point, yeah. you miss the point where God even told the people of Israel, invade the land, conquer the people, but don't chop down the trees. Mm. Right? So God is very wise. He gave us authority, but he gave us responsibility. It's not our tree. Mm. I love chopping down trees, by the way. I've also planted hundreds of them on my property yeah. because I have this belief. If you're going to chop down a tree, chop down one for you and one for me, but then plant three yeah. and the earth will always look after you if you look after it. But it's, it's, it's not a religion. It's where you say God has told us to do this to tend the earth. It's practical. It's practical. It's practical. Anything else. Yeah. We have another one in here. It says, hello, John. Could you please explain, uh, who is it from? It doesn't say. Could you please explain before sin, were there flies causing disease? We can't just say there was no death, which is true. But what about animal and human waste? God bless. Okay, what about <coughs> flies? Um, it's hard to l think of this world without flies being a problem. Mm. Right? You come to Australia, get them out of your nose, you sweep them out of your eyes, you know, the famous Aussie salute. We yeah. were always uh, wearing corks on our hats and that sort of picture of the Australian. And flies, we know if they're in the little kid's eyes, they're sooner or later, the eyes will get all pussy. Yeah, yeah. And the, the flies actually do transmit problems for mankind today. But why is the fly on your eye? The answer is it's looking for salty solutions and, and proteins. Why is it doing that? Because it can't get enough out there. The classic example is where you get things like tsetse flies right. that transmit diseases like sleeping sickness. And in reality, you discover, how does that happen? Well, the fly bites you. But it's only the female fly. You, you know how mm. only the females yeah, yeah. put the bite on you. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what you'll find is it's after protein. 
but as a consequence, if it's got any of those little parasites in its, in its salivary juices, then it goes into you, and when it gets into you where it's not meant to be, then it produces a consequence that you and I call disease. Mm. But in a perfect world that God made, think of Genesis 1, 29 and 30, God told Adam he'd only eat plants, God told Adam the animals would only eat plants. So the fly would actually get all it needed from the plant kingdom. But after Noah's flood, where God told Noah from now on, winter and summer, hey, the plants don't do well all year. In wintertime over here, particularly in the northern climes, mm. they disappear. Mm. What's the fly going to do for food now? What's it going to do in Australia where in summertime we have that problem, too much drought, too much heat? Well, it can smell the food it's after. It goes for you. And the end product is a bug that in the right place does good things is now in the wrong place. And one of the consequences is disease. Don't blame God. He warned us if we sin, mm. the penalty would be death. <clears throat> Actually, that's a good answer. That yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, I think this might have been earlier as well. Talking about the same thing. Do you believe in Genesis six? Well, uh, regarding the Nephilim seen on the earth, have you seen any giant skeletons in the field? And I think there was one a little earlier that asked also about giant skeletons. Okay. Human skeletons. It's talking about, of course. If you're referring to the, if they're referring to the Greek pictures, you know, the gigantic skulls and that, mm. then it's photoshopped. Yeah. Take it to your friend who's great on Photoshop and he'll point out the shadows going this way and the shadows going that way. That has mm. been fudged. There are no such thing as those giant humongous skeletons found in Greece. Purely con job. If you're looking at Genesis, the Genesis chapter 6 verse 4 says there were giants on the land in those days and also after that. A couple of comments you can make. It's one of the best evidences. Moses is the compiler of Genesis even though he's not the author mm. because Genesis is in segments that are stitched together with editorial comments put in. You see the comment that says only after that could have only been written by someone who was around when the next lot of giants okay, came. Yeah. Numbers chapter 13, the spies report back to Moses and there were people that made us feel like grasshoppers, you know, yeah. the Nephilim for the yeah. second time. So Nephilim translated into Latin in the Vulgate, gigantes from which we get our English okay. giant, right? But you'll find there are many subgroups of the Nephilim. There's the, uh, uh, um, the um, uh, what are they, the Rephaim, the Vegemim, and all of these other big guys. Mm. Okay. Well, wasn't Goliath part Goliath of that family Goliath was part well. of that family yeah. too. Yeah. So here's, the, here's the, the crunch. If you only had that verse in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, you could have any theory you liked about the Nephilim. Mm. You know, aliens, demons, mm. you name it. Mm. Because all of them and their descendants get wiped out in Noah's flood. Yeah. They do not continue onwards. So one verse, don't make any doctrines on one mm. verse. But there's a second batch in Nephilim that Genesis 6 verse 4 links them to. Mm. What do we know about the second lot? A whole lot. Mm. Because when the Hebrews first invaded Canaan, you find they take a note of what's on the town hall. They said, you know, we went to Hebron, which used to be called Kiriath Arba, which was founded six years before the town of Zoan in Egypt. They knew about Zoan. They'd right. been there, right? And so Kiriath Arba, that's not Hebrew. That's Canaanite, the city of Arba. And you trace Arba through. Arba is the founder of the second lot of Nephilim. Arba is not a demon. Arba is a human being. Goliath was a human being. Mm. And in reality, one reason the giants did so well then was even though their growth gland had busted and they kept on growing, they still had food. Remember the size of yeah, the grapes? Yeah, yeah. The, food, the food was doing well. Hence the land of Canaan was awash, as it says, a land of milk and honey. Yeah. And they could do well while the food did well. But Howard, do you remember how Goliath's kids are described? They oh, had six fingers, oh, yeah, six fingers and six yeah. toes. Six toes yeah. They were already on the way out. Mm. So it shouldn't surprise us, not long after the days of David, they disappear as a race off the planet. Mm. We still have giants today, people whose who's pituitary gland busts, mm. but they're usually sterile. Mm. They don't produce races and they're impressive at 25 and dead at 30 to 45. Right. Well, very conclusive and round answer that. Well, you're going to be with, I, I assume it's with Howard, I'm not sure. The other Howard. The other Howard, right. yes. Yeah, uh, this evening on Q&A. And I just want to say thank you for being with us. We've got about 30 seconds to finish. So what is next for you? 
What is next for me? Well, <coughs> in 30 seconds. Could you say anything in yes, 30 seconds? Yes, there's an awful lot of catch up on right. our askjohnmackay.com site with lots of questions. Mm -hmm. I'll be going back to our Jurassic Ark display. They can see that on creationresearch.net. That's an outdoor museum in Australia. Mm -hmm. And I'll be looking forward after eight weeks on the road to actually getting to my own bed and praising the Lord for a wonderful wife who's uh, been emailing me and Skyping me every day and saying, <laughs> when are you coming home? John, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been thank nice you, to meet Howard. you. God bless. And thank you for your comments. In fact, we're looking over there. Thank you for your comments. Which one we're looking at? There it is. And uh, join us next time on Our Mornings. But from today, God bless you. Take care. Bye-bye.